So hi there folks, it's me, Smotown, and this week we are going to be looking at the lasting legacy of Guinevere, and primarily Rosaria. My interest in this subject essentially stems from one item description, the Ring of the Sun Princess. But from this, we can try and uncover the legacy of Guinevere after she left Anne Orlando, and what has happened to her since. In this video, I will explore Guinevere's possible connection to the Queen of Lothric, and at the time of making this video, I do believe that Guinevere was the Queen of Lothric, and I will show why. In addition, we will explore some of her possible heavenly children, and who they are. This subject can go into a vast area, and to do it justice, I'm going to do kind of a two-part set of videos. First of all, on the possible heavenly daughters, covering Gertrude, Rosaria, and the Dancer. In video 2, I will examine the royal bloodline, that is, the royal family of Lothric, that covers Osirius, Ocelet, Lothric, and Lorien. Of course, all these people have a connection to Guinevere, but as I said, in this video, I will be focusing on three characters I consider to be possible daughters of Guinevere, and of course Guinevere herself. So without further ado, let us begin our video on Guinevere. Now, I don't usually look at Dark Souls 1 lore specifically, but I think it would be beneficial to us, since we are looking at Guinevere's lasting legacy here. In Dark Souls 1, we know that from the Divine Blessing, that Guinevere was revered as a goddess, for the Dark Souls 1 description states, Holy water from Goddess Guinevere, the Goddess of Sunlight, Guinevere, daughter of the great Lord of Sunlight Gwyn, is cherished by all as a symbol of bounty and fertility. We can therefore see that Guinevere was the goddess of fertility and bounty, and was clearly a loved goddess. However, we know that once the flame began to fade, and the time of Anne Orlando was ending, she left the city and her family behind. For the Ring of the Sun Princess, the Dark Souls 1 item, tells us, The Princess of Sunlight, Guinevere, left Anne Orlando along with many other deities, and later became wife to flame god Flan. We can see here that Guinevere left Anne Orlando and went on to become a wife. She most likely abandoned Anne Orlando when the flames began to fade and the time of the original gods was coming to a close. We have this information corroborated in Dark Souls 3. When we defeat Aldrich in Anne Orlando, we can make our way to Guinevere's old throne room. We find the Ring of the Sun Princess here once more as we did in Dark Souls 1. This time the ring states, Guinevere left her home with a great many other deities and became a wife and a mother, raising several heavenly children. So first thing to note is that the description is more or less the same, except it, al it doesn't allude to who she became a wife to, as well as telling us further that she went on to raise several heavenly children. So once again, we hear that Guinevere up and left her home. But why do I believe she is now the Queen of Lothric? And what happened to Flan? Well, firstly, and most obviously, we once again find the Divine Blessing within Dark Souls 3, the item that was originally associated with Guinevere in Dark Souls 1. But this time, it is being attributed to the Queen of Lothric. For it states, Holy water blessed by the Queen of Lothric. The Queen of Lothric, married to the former King Osirius, was initially revered as a goddess of fertility and bounty. After giving birth to Ocelet, her youngest, she quietly disappeared. Now again, like the Ring of the Sun Princess, the description is more or less the same, but swaps in some details. For me, the Divine Blessing in of itself, like it is now, is not enough to prove that the Queen of Lothric is Guinevere. However, this, coupled with the language used, certainly makes it likely for me. Firstly, the Queen was initially revered as a goddess of fertility and bounty, as Guinevere is worshipped as a goddess of fertility and bounty. This to me suggests that she was revered as a goddess of bounty and fertility prior to becoming known as the Queen of Lothric. Once she was Queen, she would have been revered as such. Secondly, 
there is something else here. It states that she quietly disappeared after giving birth to her youngest child. We find Lothric far past its former glory, much as we find Anor Londo in Dark Souls 1. Guinevere abandoned Anor Londo on the eve of its collapse, and it seems the Queen of Lothric has done something similar, especially if we consider her husband's descent into madness and his twisted obsession with their youngest child. To me, both are one and the same. Guinevere seems to leave her loved ones behind when she senses the end is nigh, betraying a less positive side to the usually good depiction she gets, and this happened both in Lothric and in Anor Londo. The description also, for me, raises and answers another question simultaneously, and that is, what happened to flame god Flan? If the queen was Guinevere, wouldn't she be married to Flan, you might ask? Or is a serious Flan just renamed? Well, in my opinion, no. Dark Souls 3 is set many, many ages after Dark Souls 1. Flan is most likely gone, and aside from this, what would be the need to give him a different name in the game? Remember, Dark Souls is a story of cycles. As one kingdom comes to an end, others are born with the linking of the flame. In my opinion, Guinevere also behaves in cycles. She becomes the bedrock and a mother figure to society, but as madness and dark times take hold, she quietly leaves to start again for the next age. At the end of the first age, she started a new life with her husband Flan, just as she has done with Osirius in this age, and as she will continue to do so. The Ring of the Sun Princess in Dark Souls 3, cleverly, doesn't tell who she became a wife and a mother to, leaving open the possibility that she was both a wife and a mother multiple times over. And this is the interpretation that I like to choose. There are further pieces of evidence that can support this theory, that Guinevere is the Queen of Lothric, but feel free to disagree with me on the evidence that I show. Firstly, we can see there is evidence of sun worship amongst the Knights of Lothric, the son of Crawlers, being associated with Guinevere and her family. And this worship takes the form of the Warriors of Sunlight Covenant. We find the remains of a, or maybe the, Sunlight Shrine within Lothric. In addition, the Knights of Lothric also drop Sunlight Medals, which are items associated with this covenant. The Warriors of Sunlight Covenant is associated with the firstborn of Lord Gwyn. The Sunlight Medals from Dark Souls 1 tell us such, and therefore is a form of worship linked to the Old Pantheon, which of course Guinevere is a central figure of. The placement of this worship in the Kingdom of Lothric in the Queen's Realm, to me is another indicator that the Queen of this realm is in fact Guinevere. We also hear that the Queen of Lothric was a kind and caring person, and she cared about the forsaken warriors trapped in the purgatory world of the untended graves. We learn this from the description of the Hidden Blessing, for it states, There is a grave in Lothric that sees no visitors, a dark place where rootless warriors rest. The Queen of Lothric alone cared to wish the poor souls good fortune. Although this is obviously not concrete evidence, it does marry up to what we know about Guinevere from her miracles, because we know that her bountiful sunlight miracle offers comfort to a great many warriors, such as the Queen is offering comfort to these poor souls in the untended graves. This maternalistic and caring nature comes across from the Hidden Blessing description, for she alone cares for these helpless warriors, and she offers them mercy where no one else would. This to me sounds very much something that Guinevere would do. There is what also appears to be one of Guinevere's miracles that are taught to the Knights of Lothric, and it provides another link between the Queen of Lothric and Guinevere. In particular, I am referring to the miracle Bountiful Light, which although doesn't mention Guinevere, is very similar to the miracle Bountiful Sunlight, just a lesser extrapolation. The description states, Miracle taught to knights by Gertrude, holy maiden to the queen, gradually restores a large amount of HP. The heavenly daughter is said to be the queen's child. This miracle was taught by one of the queen's maidens, Gertrude, and we know from soothing sunlight that Guinevere's miracles were passed down to her maidens, 
for it states, special miracle granted to the maidens of the Princess of Sunlight. Could it not be that Bountiful Light is a lesser, second-hand version of the Princess's Sunlight Miracle? A miracle passed down to her maiden, who in turn taught her own lesser version to knights? The semantics certainly lead me to believe so, and there are too many connections here for it to be coincidence. I think that Guinevere was first revered, as she always has been, as the goddess of bounty and fertility, but later she became the Queen of Lothric, and as she always does, became a mother and a wife. She passed down her miracles to her maidens, which was in turn passed to the knights of Lothric, who served her. But once Osirius began to go mad, and Lothric began to fall to the curse and other civil discord, she left, as she always does, to await the resetting of the cycle, at which point she could start again anew. The cruel fate of many of her children may also have given her cause to leave, and I will now move on to the possible heavenly children that the Ring of the Sun Princess refers to. All of these possible children do not have a happy ending, and if these were her children, who could blame Guinevere for leaving? We have already mentioned one possible daughter, Gertrude, for the miracle Bountiful Light tells us that not only was she a maiden of the Queen, who I believe to be Guinevere, but it was also rumoured that she was her daughter. I have covered Gertrude in regards to her role in the angelic faith in another video, and so that if that is what you're interested in, I would refer you to go to that. This time around, I am going to be mainly looking at her possible connection to the Queen in a familial sense, rather than her role with the angelic faith. The Ring of the Sun Princess specifically refers to heavenly children, and we know that Gertrude was known as the Heavenly Daughter, for the miracle Divine Pillars of Light state, Miracle of Gertrude, the Heavenly Daughter. The Queen's Holy Maiden Gertrude was visited by an angel, who revealed this tale to her. So we know that Gertrude was visited by an angel, and that she was the source of the angelic faith. And I initially thought that this was the only reason that she was known as the Heavenly Daughter, and it is most likely still the main reason. However, the plain words cannot be avoided. She is a heavenly daughter, or child, and considering this and her connection to possible Guinevere, I believe she is one of the heavenly children being referred to. This is of course my connection that I've made. Feel free to disagree. She also seems to share Guinevere's, or her mother's, care for knights and soldiers. We can see this through the Bountiful Light Miracle. I look at Gertrude's story in more detail in my Angelic Faith video, but suffice it to say she suffered as a result of her instigating what would be known as the Angelic Faith. We know from the Divine Pillars of Light miracle that she was rendered mute and blind. We also know from the Winged Knight armour set that she was imprisoned in the Grand Archives, and she most likely died there, but not before having a profound influence on the people of Lothric. There is another female character who shares Gertrude's lack of voice, and this is of course Rosaria, the mother of rebirth. We can find Rosaria in her bedchamber within the Cathedral of the Deep. To me, the positioning here is not insignificant. I will go on to kind of comment upon Rosaria's dark nature, but suffice it to say the Cathedral of the Deep was home to very dark and dangerous beings, being referred to as of the Deep. The deep is linked to the dark, but whether or not the deep is the same thing as the dark, or a different thing, is something for another time. Just keep in mind that the deep and the dark are not good things. Rosaria offers rebirth to the character, and others, in exchange for offerings. However, the game warns that too many rebirths will result in a transformation into a mangrub, which explains why so many mangrubs guard her chamber. The Mangrub staff can offer a further insight into these poor souls, for it states, Staff of the Mangrubs who guard Rosaria's bedchamber. Their holy symbol is formed at the tip. The Mangrubs have clearly been reborn, but as what? Despite their grotesque appearance and disfigurement, they seem all too willing to serve and guard their goddess. Perhaps their addiction to rebirth led them to do it too many times or perhaps they came to choose this willingly 
to serve their queen better. Nevertheless, they will loyally defend their goddess. Rosaria seems to care for them too, because we can see her gently cradling one in her arms. We know that Rosaria is mute, because she lacks a tongue, because the obscuring ring, a covenant reward, tells us, It is said that Rosaria, the mother of rebirth, was robbed of her tongue by her firstborn, and she has been waiting for their return ever since. Her firstborn child robbed her tongue. Who this firstborn is, we do not know. However, we know the fingers of Rosaria, her covenant, exist to bring tongues to their goddess. For the Rosaria Fingers Covenant Seal tells us, Rosaria's fingers collect tongues in her name. Some do it to be reborn, others do it to help comfort their voiceless goddess. We know that you can exchange these tongues in return for Rosaria granting you rebirth. However, it suggests that some members gather tongues merely to offer comfort. What comfort? What comfort could these bring? In my opinion, there are two explanations for this. One, the fingers hope that amongst the offerings of tongue, one may give her her voice back. This is probably a futile hope. Or two, which is my preferred and a darker explanation, is that now that many more beings are tongueless, as evidenced by the pile of tongues, this might offer their goddess some comfort that others suffer as she does. These fingers include members such as Ringfinger Leonard, Yellowfinger Hazel, Longfinger Kirk, and Creighton the Wanderer. Most, obviously, have the word finger in their name, except for Creighton. However, we do know he is one, for Ceres tells us so, once we help her defeat him. Yellowfinger Hazel is one of the more interesting members of the gang for me. Leonard mockingly remarks, once we join the Covenant, that we may think like her, that there is camaraderie between fingers, but do not force this romance upon us. He believes that beyond gathering tongues, there are no rules. Hazel is also an Ulusil researcher and a sorcerer, because her pick states, Choice weapon of Yellowfinger Hazel, a finger of Rosaria, and a Xanthus scholar. We find her study in the swamps of Farin, where you can collect an Ulysseal golden scroll, after she attempts to defend it. She wears the Xanthus crown, a symbol of an Ulysseal researcher. This is no doubt where her yellow finger moniker comes from, as the colour yellow is oft associated with Ulysseal and its study. However, there is something else worth noting about Hazel. She appears to be the daughter of the head acolyte of the Undead Legion, for the great fire and dart states entrusted to the leader of the legion's acolytes and apparently a sorcery of his daughter hazel that was refined by a crystal sage so it seems that hazel was the first sorcerer linked with the undead legion and that her spells were later refined by the crystal sage this explains hazel's presence here she has familial ties but has instead chosen to walk the oath of the fingers However, the Brotherhood of the Watchdog of Farron may explain why she is influenced to believe that there is camaraderie between her fingers. But this is my conjecture about her placement. Hazel is clearly fascinated with Ulysseal, but she is also a finger of Rosaria. An interesting combination. For what purpose? Well, perhaps she intends to use the power of rebirth to be reborn with someone with greater knowledge of Ulysseal, or have the potential to get greater knowledge of the sorceries of Ulysseal. Invent your own reasons here as I have, but it is certainly a point worth considering. Ultimately, Yellowfinger becomes one with her fellows, as we later find a mangrub in Rosaria's bedchamber with Hazel's gear. She clearly attempted rebirth once too often. There's not much information on the Longfinger Kirk, except that he plays the same role as the character of the same name in Dark Souls 1 and could be a descendant of the same, or it could well be the very same character, or a copycat. He invades us in the Cathedral of the Deep, the same realm where Rosaria inhabits, most likely attempting to gather pale tongues for his goddess, much as Kirk and Dark Souls 1 did for the Fair Lady, both women who suffered from certain infirmities. Finally, one of the most important of Rosaria's fingers is Leonard Ringfinger, the Ringfinger 
obviously been an important finger in modern society. And indeed, Leonard plays an important role in bringing us into the fold. He does not believe in the romance of brotherhood within the fingers, and he tells us this upon joining. However, he does suggest that his mistress will be pleased with his efforts in recruiting you. He starts this recruitment process by giving you red eye orbs, cracked ones, and then directing you to a whole one. And then, after you are addicted to invading, he invites you to become a finger. This suggests that he plays the role of recruiter within the Covenant, the ring finger being responsible for bringing other fingers to Rosaria. We know that Leonard is of royalty, for his armour set tells us, Leonard was born into royalty, which is believed to be the reason for his skill in both sorcery and swordsmanship. So that tells us where Leonard is from, and explains why he is such a skilled combatant when we fight him. His silver mask tells us more about his past. It states, In his youth, Leonard suffered grave burns to his entire body. His face in particular, which he hid beneath his mask, was terribly scalded. He abstained from restoring these injuries, even after becoming a finger of Rosaria. This armour set gives us a good background into understanding Leonard and why he set out on a journey of rebirth. Indeed, we also see from the Crescent Moon Sword that Leonard set out on a journey of rebirth, but decided instead to serve the goddess as a knight and inherited this weapon. It seems that Leonard did initially intend to be reborn, no doubt to help remove his scarred body. However, upon actually meeting what he considered to be a goddess, he decided to put aside his own desires and instead serve this goddess. He then inherited this weapon, which suggests it was handed down by the goddess herself. This is interesting because it is imbued with the power of the moon. The moon is usually associated with either Seath the Scaleless or Gwendolyn, and it could be an indicator of her familial ties to the latter. Leonard, for whatever reason, chooses to serve his queen without being reborn. Perhaps his burns are a reminder as to why he serves her, or perhaps he fears becoming a grub and becoming useless to her. This is obviously pure speculation. Clearly, Leonard plays the Law Trek character in Dark Souls 3, a dubious character who fights with a Shoto-like weapon, but nonetheless faithfully serves his goddess. He eventually kills Rosaria's body and takes her soul. We know that he is the killer because the Black Eye Orb's description tells us that the orb will take us to her killer, the killer being Leonard. We can track him down in the old cathedral of Anorlondo, where he has brought Rosaria's soul to Guinevere's old bedchamber. Despite killing her, Leonard believes that he is serving his goddess in his own way, for he states when you attack him, Never expected to see you here. Couldn't resist her any longer in all her festering glory. And now you want to ravage her soul as well. He believes you are to ravage her soul, and he will not let you do this. He also talks about sowing the seeds, so he must prune the mess. He is clearly talking about how he was the one that brought you into the fold, and now it is he who needs to end you. He seems to have become paranoid, believing that you are here for her soul, to take it for your own, and you might well be. He also makes a comment that her form or flesh was not enough for you, referring of course to her body that he left behind. And in fact, for gameplay reasons, her body can be enough, because it still operates as if she was alive. We can be reborn, and we can offer tongues. He also calls himself a Knight of the Goddess, which is unsurprising, as we know from this dialogue that he swore an oath to her. Perhaps this oath included his refusal to be reborn, or his dedication to recruit other fingers to her cause. But then why did he kill her? And why did he bring her soul to Anor Londo? Well, first of all, he seems paranoid. Perhaps your efforts in offering tongues to Rosaria has got him paranoid that you yourself are beginning to make designs upon the goddess. This paranoia takes over, he kills her, and takes her soul away, in his mind saving her from you. There's obviously some people who are going to believe that the position of Rosaria's soul here 
is evidence that Rosaria is in fact Guinevere, and that he is trying to revive her in her original form. However, it also could be that he is merely taking her here because of the cathedral's link to her possible family. Personally, as I've said before, I don't believe Rosaria is Guinevere. I believe that Guinevere was once the Queen of Lothric and has once again departed before disaster struck Lothric, and that Rosaria is one of her heavenly children. But the point still stands that I believe Leonard is bringing the soul here to allow her to be reborn, maybe in her full form with tongue intact. Whatever you think, there clearly are links to Guinevere, not only by this placement, but by the soul item itself. If traded at Firelink Shrine, we are granted the Bountiful Sunlight Miracle, which states, Special Miracle Granted by the Princess of Sunlight. The Miracles of Guinevere, loved as both a mother and a wife, bestow their blessing on a great many warriors. We can therefore see that Rosaria has some connection to Guinevere. She is in fact worshipped as a goddess of rebirth. Thematically, this is very similar to Guinevere's sphere of fertility. Both have to do with the creation of life. And in fact, I see Rosaria as a perversion of Guinevere's realm. Her mother represents the natural cycle of life, whereas Rosaria herself represents an unnatural cycle of rebirth. And we can see the result of this in the mangrubs. Both Guinevere and Rosaria are seen as mother figures, for Rosaria's soul tells us, The soul of Rosaria, mother of rebirth, stolen by ring finger Leonard, return this to her extant corpse, and mother Rosaria will spring back to life. And indeed she does, should you return her soul, it's as if nothing ever happened. This could be seen by many as another factor that indicates that Rosaria is Guinevere, however I still see her as her own different character. She's an inversion of Guinevere, of her mother. However, she shares many qualities with her mother, and despite her dark nature, she can be nurturing to her followers. She grants her followers rewards and the opportunity to change their appearance or skills. She even seems to be gently cradling one of the mangrubs as if a mother would a child. There is another follower of Rosaria who is important to analyse if we are to understand her worship fully and this is Saint or Archdeacon Klimt. We know that he was once an Archdeacon, for the Covenant Seal tells us such, and that this is a sacred seal of Archdeacon Klimt originally. This seal becomes a symbol for the Covenant, which may suggest that Klimt was the first follower of Rosaria. We learn more about Klimt from the Saint's Biden, which states, A silver Biden, decorated by a holy symbol, formerly wielded by Saint Klimt. He discarded this weapon that draws upon one's faith on the day that he put his own faith behind him. Firstly, Clement is named as a saint, much like Saint Aldrich, which suggests he was a very important and respected figure in the way of white, but as we know from Aldrich, it's not necessarily meaning he's a good thing. In Christianity, saints are only canonised when they are dead, so it seems to suggest that he has passed although we can consider the worship of Rosaria to be his legacy. It goes on to say that he put his own faith behind him. The language suggests that Klimt forsook the way of white, most likely to serve Rosaria, and the seal tells us this. Something else I notice about the Mangrub mages, which I consider to be part of his legacy, is the bolts that they fire from his staff. If you look carefully when they fire it, they look very much like his Biden. Klimt forsook his way of white beliefs, and indeed I believe Rosaria to be a perversion of the traditional way of white pantheon. As mentioned before, she is a dark reflection of her mother Guinevere, representing a perversion of natural life and birth. Much like her mother, she is found reclining on a bed, but instead of the radiance beauty that her mother once exuded, Rosaria strikes a more repulsive and sinister figure, or as Leonor puts it, in all her festering glory. Her placement, as I've mentioned before, in the Cathedral of the Deep is no coincidence. Much like Aldrich, it may seem that Rosaria has a connection to the Deep or the Dark. However, what it obviously shows is that Rosaria is contrary 
to the traditional way of white belief system. And if we look at the Cathedral of the Deep itself, it is a place where dangerous and dark things are kept, things that are a danger to the way of white. Rosaria can be considered one of these things. She is a perversion of its very ideals, and in fact, of one of its central figures. On one final design note, and I may be looking far too much into this, in her hair, we see white strands. These could just be white streaks, but it looks uneven and liquid-like, like wax has been poured over her head. This could imply a connection to the Grand Archives and her possible sister, Gertrude. It is something to note, and is obviously my complete speculation. Feel free to draw your own conclusions. Another thing that links Rosaria to her sister and the Grand Archives is the presence of a mangrub servant near Gertrude's cage. What on earth is he doing here? He is out of place with the rest of the placements in this area. To me, it can't be insignificant. Could it be that Rosaria is spying on her sister, or trying to rescue her? Who knows, but it seems that Rosaria does have some connection, or agents, in the Grand Archives. Overall, Rosaria is one of the most interesting characters to me, despite the fact she has no actual dialogue. She is very mysterious, and is a clear allusion to Guinevere, and a perversion of that very image that we see in Dark Souls 1, of that golden radiant goddess lying on a bed. Instead, we find a dark, damp room, with a very dark reflection of Guinevere found within it. And for all these reasons, I find her to be a very interesting character, and one only hopes that more is revealed in future DLC. There is one final possible daughter I wish to discuss in this video, and that is the dancer of the Boreal Valley. Now, as with Gertrude, I discussed the dancer in some detail in my Pontiff video, so I apologise for those who have already heard me speak of her. We know from the dancer's crown that she is of royalty, for the crown states, the mirage-like aurora veil is said to be an article of the old gods, permitted only for direct descendants of the old royal family. This piece of equipment, despite the language used in her soul, confirms that she is a direct member of the old gods, which again reinforces my opinion that she is a member of the old gods, and in fact a candidate to be one of Guinevere's daughters. What is clear from her gear is that she is of royal blood, and therefore a threat to Pontiff Sullivan rule, resulting in her exile under the guise of serving her peers. Her soul tells us this as well. However, what is far more interesting about her soul is that it can be crafted into the soothing sunlight miracle. Its description tells us, special miracle granted to the maidens of the Princess of Sunlight. The miracles of Guinevere, the princess cherished by all, bestow their blessing on a great many warriors. We can see that this miracle is clearly related to the miracle Bountiful Sunlight, which in turn suggests a relation between Rosaria and the Dancer. Secondly, it also mentions that the miracle is granted to maidens of the goddess, which in my mind means attendance of Guinevere. This is mentioned in a miracle we have already examined, Divine Pillars of Light, which describe Gertrude also to be a maiden, and we also know that Gertrude is most likely Guinevere's daughter. To me, this correlation can suggest that all three were daughters of Guinevere, and at least two of them were also maidens. There is no evidence that I can see of Rosaria being referred to as a maiden. However, we can infer that all these daughters of Guinevere also serve her as maidens, which reflects her very religious nature of Guinevere's bloodline. The language of the soul here is interesting. It states a distant daughter of the formal royal family. Distant could mean that she's not a direct descendant of Guinevere, but is nonetheless related. However, it could also be that she is distant in a spatial sense, in the fact that she doesn't have a role within the pantheon. She is clearly linked to the Boreal Valley, and it seems to be separate from her the ruling body of Lothric. Whatever the case, I do class the Dancer as a possible daughter of Guinevere, and is certainly related to Guinevere, because of the miracle that can be made from her soul, which is clearly linked to Guinevere. Pontiff Sullivan clearly sees the connection, and as I discussed in my previous videos, he takes steps to remove all remnants of the old royal family 
Gwyn's family to solidify his rule at the top of the Way of White, resulting in the Dancer's exile and ultimate transformation into the beast we fight in-game. Guinevere has far more children, including her youngest, Ocelet, and most probably the twin princes as a result of her marriage to Oserios. Next time, I will cover the royal family of Lothric, but for now, we must leave it there so we can do this justice. So thanks guys for listening to me ramble about Guinevere. I just find that somehow Guinevere always manages to be an interesting part of these games, despite the fact we never meet her in any part of the game. Obviously, I built this video on the premise that I believe that she is the Queen of Lothric. Feel free to disagree, although I do understand that that is kind of the common understanding at this point as well. Um, a lot of people will think that Rosaria is Guinevere, so feel free to disagree. And I really enjoyed talking about Rosaria. As you can tell, she is one of my favourite characters. So thanks for listening, guys, um, and I'll be back next time with the Lothric royal family. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned.